Seven. Hello, after 27 years today, we're saying goodbye to our chief executive, Michael Betton, who'll be leaving us in oh, just a couple of days' time here at Lynx FM. 27 years since he first walked through the doors. When I started, I was just a humble managing director, but now I'm chief executive, not that it makes much difference. We were one of the very first licenses awarded competitively by the Radio Authority. The Radio Authority was created in 1990 as a result of a Broadcasting Act and they went about advertising licenses in areas that didn't have commercial radio, so-called white areas, and Lincoln Show was one of them. Hi, how are you doing? Hello. Thank you. How are you doing? Yeah, yeah, I'm well. I was okay until I saw you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Told that I had to be back by two o'clock later. <laughs> this is Link Seven. Music for the summer of '92 in Lincolnshire. Well, thank you. You? Yeah, good. Good, good. Hello, Hello. Can we give me a hug? No. How are you? 102.2 With all the best songs from the number to the wash From love, love me do To saving all my love for you Stereo links at them Before a radio station goes on air officially, obviously it needs to know that its transmitter is functioning properly. Otherwise, uh, it's going to be problematic, isn't it? So they turn it on marginally uh, a few weeks before uh, the official programmes begin. And that just is to see that it it works properly and everybody can hear it uh, right around the area. And that is the most magical moment. I remember we were coming back from one of our bus trips one day. And we had the radio on and 102.2 was there with just hiss on it. And suddenly the hiss stopped and we thought, gosh, this is it. The station's going to come alive and the, the tingle that goes down your, your spine is just phenomenal when you, you hear the, uh, the first announcements, which is me uh, and, and the first song come on. You're listening to a test transmission from Lynx FM, the new independent commercial radio station for Lincolnshire and South Humberside. Lynx FM begins broadcasting in March with a 24-hour service of music, local news and information. This is a test transmission from Lynx FM on 102.2. Lynx We decided to launch on a Sunday morning to give as many people the possibility of, of tuning in without it disrupting their, their daily lives. And so much planning had gone into it. I'd been thinking of that day for so long. When it actually came round, I, I, I had expected to be nervous. But I, I guess as, as managing director, you've briefed everybody, you've told everybody what they need to do, and all you can do is sit back and hope that they get it right, which of course they did. Think. If you could genetically engineer the very character of a new radio service, what qualities would you choose? Some good music, uh, simply red, preferably anything like that. Bit of rock and roll. I would definitely like to hear a lot of Phil Collins, the Beatles, or any of the early sixties. News about the actual area, travel news. Weather forecasts for the local area. Definitely things on travel, um, up-to-date weather information. From today, enjoy the new sound of your kind of radio station. Radio for historic Lincolnshire. Lynx FM. Welcome. Serving Lincolnshire and South Humberside 24 hours a day on 102.2, this is Lynx FM. The news at two minutes past ten. I'm Claire Carson. Lynx FM, the new 24-hour radio station serving Lincolnshire, South Humberside and Newark, is now broadcasting live from its studios at Witham Park in Lincoln. It'll broadcast a mix of music, local news and information on 102.2 FM. Since we divide between the current crop and the old gigs... (laughs) And you're in the middle, yeah, yeah. Um, Michael, you've probably noticed there isn't a strategy meeting at two o'clock. <laughs> You've rushed back for nothing. Um, it's hard to believe, actually, it was 27 years ago to this very day, there was a massive hive of activity in this building because we were building up to 
Sunday, March the 1st, Lynx FM would be going on air. Um, step forward, those who are here, 27 years ago to the day. Come on, come on. Who was in on it? There we are, look. <laughs> the original mob. Debbie. Debbie as well. I, um, I imagine, I wasn't here on the first day, but I imagine there'd be the, the smell of fresh paint, the smell of glue from the carpet, or Eddie's first hairpiece, one of the other. <laughs> Um, <laughs> there we go. Is it what it was? It was. Yeah? There was a smell of wood. In the smell studios. of wood, really? Because oh. up until just a few days before we had to go there, I remember there was, you know this. There were still there, people yeah, working in the studio actually making yeah. sure that it was all wired and ready to go. Getting, trying to get it all ready. I know Nigel, Eddie, the team were all very, very busy uh, getting the studios ready. Uh, Jeff, Debbie, Karen, David. And the rest of the team working hard. Karen wasn't quite here at the beginning, but you know she's, she's never worked hard since. Getting ready for the first commercial. I think the first commercial arrived. Was it was on a train about an hour before broadcast or something. Was no, it on a bike? No, uh, it was coming by train. It was supposed to get to Lincoln Station. It actually went to Nottingham Station. So we had to get in a car and drive to Nottingham at about 300 miles an hour to get the thing back on time. Amazing. The presenting team, obviously, they were busy. Uh, Eddie and Andy are still here somewhere. Where are you, Eddie? There's Andy. Where's Eddie? Oh, yeah. Watch out. Yeah. <laughs> stood, next to, stood, stand up. stood next to the shortest oh, yeah. person in the room, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> the, the team had taken a minibus around Lincolnshire and Yurt to try and find out all about the area. David Lloyd, who sadly Michael can't be here, it's his birthday today and he's in Paris but he almost got a flight back, because you know what David's like. He'd be dashing around as David used to dash around. And of course the news team, Rod, is here, and uh, Lara and Claire and Jackie would be around this area here, although not this desk. I remember Eddie putting this desk in on a Sunday afternoon. Do you remember that? That was, that was a lot of work, but it wasn't this desk back then, uh, getting ready for those first news bulletins. Of course, at the centre of it all, watching over every detail was Michael. Alongside his PA, at the time, Debbie Page. <laughs> She's had more names than I've had hot dinners. <laughs> um, <laughs> and in one way, he's had a few hot dinners. <laughs> and I've had a few hot dinners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in one way, it kind of seems out that we've come full circle because sadly Janie can't be here. She's in uh, New Zealand. Uh, seeing a son who is devastated, she's not here today either. But of course, Debbie was the PA those first days and is now the PA for the last days of <laughs> Michael's time here. So we have come, come full circle. Now, although Friday is uh, Lincoln's Firm's 27th birthday, the station, indeed the group, I think has survived in Michael's mind a lot longer than that. And of course, uh, without Michael, none of us would be here now. None of this would be possible. His uh, passion for local radio has never dimmed. It started when he was at school. Um, he would um, used to sneak in a little radio and a little earpiece and would listen to the cricket when he was supposed to be learning uh, things. He got caught once and the teacher said to him, it's all right, just tell us the score, which was good. And he persuaded his headmaster to build a radio station at the school. And then at the age of 15, he joined Radio Orwell. And um, well, the rest is kind of history. He was going every holiday at school and university to help out at Radio Orwell. It's fair to say, um, while Michael enjoyed presenting, he was far more fascinated in the actual workings of a radio station, the art of radio, if you like, the, the behind the scenes, the one-to-one -one communication. So at 24, became a program controller of Ocean Sound. He never thought he'd get the job, did you? Um, it was Michael that had to persuade, uh, sorry, Maggie that persuaded Michael to, uh, to go for the job. He didn't think he'd stand a cat in hell's chance of getting it, but much to his surprise, he did. And that's where his management started in radio. Uh, one accusation made of Lynx FM over the years is that we played it safe. But actually, nothing could be further from the truth. And Michael never did play it safe. You know, he went for the Lincolnshire licence, despite everyone saying it wouldn't work. Um, he actually left his job at Ocean Sound before he knew whether he'd won the Lynx FM licence. He was working for Eddie at the time. And when he got the phone call to say, you've got the licence, he didn't tell anybody. He carried on working for Eddie. It was only in the evening when he finally got around to telling people he'd actually won this radio licence. Um, people said at the time there would not be enough revenue for a commercial radio station in Lincolnshire. He um, proved them wrong, alongside, of course, the great Ed Nuffin. When he won the licence, um, he then had to go around the county, literally knocking on doors, 
persuading people to invest in the radio station and get the shareholders on board. And you know, without his work doing that, then again, the radio station would just never have got off the ground. Uh, few realise actually the coverage of Links FM is actually double the size of what it really should be. Again, it was a risk Michael took. He saw a loophole, and there was meant to be no Grimsby, no Scunthorpe, very little south of Lincoln. But he saw this loophole, and when he switched it on, you could hear Links FM in Oxford, in Birmingham, uh, the outskirts of Manchester, um, and the radio authority called him up and said, you've got to turn it down. And he said, nope. And that has led to the size of Links FM that it is today and the success of Links FM. He took risks with the regulator again, taking them to court over the initial Doncaster decision, um, and eventually won that, of course, and Trax FM is now on air. And he didn't give up when license applications didn't quite go our way. If you think of the first East Yorkshire license, uh, it was won by KCFM. Um, it was clear they'd overpromised, and at the first opportunity, Michael jumped in there and seized the opportunity, and we acquired KCFM. He still us through a second recession in 2008, ignoring the banks who were saying we should sell or we'd risk losing everything, and he persuaded the investors to hold their nerve, and rightly so. And even last year, he took that risk in applying for a radio station license in Ipswich, uh, one that everyone said would fail, and not only did he win it, the first time Ofcom had awarded a license to someone other than the incumbent owner, but he got it on air within a matter of weeks. I first met Michael on election night 1992, um, I had no idea who he was. Um, I was, uh, I was helping out and we met at about five o'clock in the morning somewhere near the news desk. He'd just come off air having done the overnight show for the election night. I'd been volunteering and I just thought he was someone who knew politics. I didn't realise his significance in the company at the time and, and what he made of his upstart who had an awful Scunthorpe accent and blonde hair, I had no idea. I've since lost both, the Scunthorpe accent and sadly the hair. Um, but little did I realise at the time what an impact uh, Michael would come to have on my life and I think on all of our working lives. I had no idea I'd end up co-presenting future election night programmes with him. I thought the way Theresa May was going we might get one more in before the time is out. I suppose there's still time. <laughs> Maybe tomorrow. Um, I had no idea that my dream of being on the radio would come true. Never mind the honour of being Director of Programming for the last decade or so. All thanks to Michael's guidance over the years. If I'm honest, he could be irritating. <laughs> <laughs> his passion always meant he was listening, always, day and night. And you could do the best programme ever, the best news bulletin ever, you could bring in a huge amount of revenue, and his catchphrase would be, but what are you going to do tomorrow? <laughs> and the irritating thing, the reason he was irritating was because, you know, he would find something that could have gone better, and he was always right about it as well, always. Apart from maybe the paint colour. <laughs> we agreed to disagree on that many years ago. He dared to be different, he didn't follow the pack, didn't go down the route of networking or, or narrowing our music policy, aiming it at a narrow age of listeners. Um, you know, we've all at some stage, I think, heard him reiterate the point, we are broadcasters, not narrowcasters, and there's a reason all of our stations remain uniquely local to each of their areas. Yes, we might share buildings, yes, we might share some of the programming teams, but Michael, more than anyone, understands the importance of engaging local radio. While the future is uncertain and we wait to see what Friday brings, it's true to say this place won't be the same without Michael. And uh, for me, I'm not getting upset, I'm just reading. <laughs> the uh, Links of M Group, I think the Links of M Group became uh, real the first time, in my mind anyway, when Michael walked through that door for the very first time. And I think. It won't end at midnight on Thursday, but actually the Links FM group will end when Michael finally walks out that door sometime over the next 48 hours. Uh, I think I can speak for everyone here today, and those who sadly couldn't make it, and there was a number who sent their best wishes, in saying thank you. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to work in a brilliant industry. Thank you for the many, many hours of radio that you've created, you've helped and made us produce over the years, and I think radio in general definitely will be poorer without you in it. Now, I know you're a man of few words, and you probably don't want to uh, give much of a speech, um, which is why we're mingling over pizza, but we do have a little gift for you. You can climb up on the ear if you want. I'm not climbing up there. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Do you want me to look at this first? <laughs> I feel like somebody unveiling a claw. <laughs> 
That's fantastic. There's no way I could ever forget, but in fact I won't. Um, this is a moment I, I never dreamt of in two ways. That there'd be people here, I kind of thought I'd just be walking out the door. But thank you, all of you, for making sure that that didn't happen. Um, this has been half my life. And it wouldn't have been what it was without the support of all of you. And I think the way that people care about what we do, and I don't mean that as just what we broadcast, but every aspect of the business. Um, if there was something that was always important for me, it was that we would look after staff as individuals. Um, we would try and appoint people not who had all the experience and expertise that we were looking for, um, but people who wanted to succeed, who had an aspiration. And that is why I think we've succeeded. Um, I am just truly grateful to all of you for your support. I'd like to thank, um, in particular, the strategy team that support me at the moment. Um, they've been quite exceptional quite exceptional in the way they responded to some of my crazy ideas, always finding a way to cope with things. And that has been just the same with what has been bombshell news just a few weeks ago. Um, I'd like to thank those people who helped me start the radio station, um, Jeff in particular, for um, making sure that we got on air with, with some revenue. Um, and all of those who helped along the way. Thank you to those of you who've made special trips. Um, Paul tells me he flew down from Sh uh, Shetland especially for today. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure I believe in fun. <laughs> Eddie, thank you so much for coming up uh, from Stevenage. Um, without Eddie, none of this building and many of our other buildings uh, wouldn't have been possible. Um, Sean kindly mentioned in his speech, most of which was true. Am I really that irritating? <laughs> probably, probably more. Um, without a Navid, this wouldn't have been possible. Um, I know some of you don't know him, but his, his enthusiasm until his demise a year ago for this operation, despite it not really being something that he understood, he was enthusiastic about it because of the people involved. Um, and that's really what excited him. And actually, that's true for me too. I think Sean's right. My passion started as being a broadcaster, but actually it's working with people, seeing new people come into the business. That's the bit that I'm going to miss most of all. For those of you who are still working with the company, I'm sorry that this is probably the first time you ask me what's going to happen and I haven't got any convincing answer. Um, my influence ceases in about 48 hours. I do wish you all the very best for the future. Um, I, I'd also like to say, um, that Sean already mentioned, uh, I know Janie was very upset she couldn't be here for the final, um, final period. It has been an extraordinarily difficult time getting to this point, um, an awful lot of twists and turns that very few other people saw. And I think I can quite um, confidently say that without Jamie's support and help, um, we wouldn't have got to where we are now. So I could go on. Um, I won't because I don't want to talk for longer than Sean. But I'm really, <laughs> <laughs> I'm really utterly flattered to see so many people here today, um, so many people who have meant so much to me. So thank you very much. I won't say too much more. Thank you. Now Ant, do you want to go lead everyone out? Yeah.